so this is the title of my uh, master's dissertation, Maximising Academic Attainment from Positive Attitudes Towards Science. So it's kind of two little concepts there. The one is academic attainment, which can be quite narrow, uh, but we'll come on to that in a bit. And the second part is the positive attitudes. Attitudes is quite difficult to uh, explain, so we'll come, I'll talk about that a little bit in methodology. Uh, so the context is last year, I took on the role of head of sick form physics at my school, which is a local uh, independent school. And from my perspective, I felt that within my role, I needed to uh, increase positive attitudes. I wanted the students to be positive uh, towards physics, but science as a whole. And I also wanted them to achieve good grades, but that was also kind of a school, a whole school kind of concept, idea that I was going to promote. Uh, so historically, and this is from Osborne et al, uh, 2010, when students enter secondary school, their attitudes towards science decline. Now this only takes us up to uh, 2000, and it's A-level uh, data on the three sciences. But you can see, from my point of view, for physics, uh, there's a, a significant decline. Now recently there's been a slight increase, but the general trend is that students aren't picking up physics as a post-16 qualification when they have the choice to do it. And so it's a concern, and that's something that I want to try and work against. This isn't just national, this is also international, uh, particularly in the OECD countries. There's lots of evidence that students are really falling out of love with school science. Not outside school science, but within school science. Uh, so this is uh, historically about the attitudes. This is the attainment. So for the same time framework where the students behaviourally, they're not choosing to study science or physics past the point of choice, their attainment is increasing dramatically. Uh, this is GCSE attainment, not A level, and it's over a 20 year basis. And you can see in each of the three sciences, uh, they've increased huge amounts. Now there's debates raging about whether that's grade inflation, whether that's better teaching and learning, so on and so forth. I didn't really want to get involved with that debate. I just wanted to acknowledge that students are experiencing greater success at GCSE Science, but not choosing to study it after GCSE Science. So there's a kind of disconnection there. And so that, I felt, was a little facet that I'd like to investigate. Sorry, can I just ask, is that the separate the triple science as opposed to the double science? Yeah, this is the triple science. Right, yeah. okay, yeah. That's, yeah. We're going to come up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. this is the triple science. So, another kind of interest for me, and this is why it was such a personal kind of case study, is that I identify with being a physics teacher. Uh, I have a degree in physics, I studied physics for a long time. My previous school, I taught just physics. My new school, uh, I've been asked to teach double science, which is a bit of biology, a bit of chemistry. And initially I kind of rebuked that and found it quite difficult. And I realised my teaching was different. When I was teaching biology, I was a bit less risk-taking, I was a bit nervous, a bit cautious, a bit scared if students asked questions, so on and so forth. And I initially thought, well, in which case, my teaching of biology and chemistry must be much worse than that of physics. That was anecdotal kind of evidence, but I wanted to kind of flesh that out and see if that was true. Uh, so if we look at, I mean, this is 2006, so it will change slightly now with uh, government initiatives, but see, this is a science teacher's qualifications, uh, the actual percentages we've got here, but physics was about 10%, so only one in 10 uh, science teachers actually had a physics degree. Uh, chemistry was a bit more, I think this goes up to about 20 uh, biology about 35, 40, uh, about close to half had a science related degree, so you're talking engineering and so on and so forth. Uh, but physics is kind of the minority subject, which means a lot of students who are studying GCSE science aren't being taught uh, by physics teachers or people with uh, a specialist qualification in physics. I have to be careful with the terminology here. So I didn't want to come in with this idea of a specialist teacher which is seen a lot in the literature simply because 
within the school I was working at, there were chemistry teachers who had been teaching physics at GCSE for 20 years, and you could easily identify them as specialists within that area, although they didn't have, would not fulfill this criteria. So rather than using specialist science teachers, I moved towards preferred teaching subject. That was a bit of a change in the language which would give me a little bit more freedom. Uh, so during the literature review, I was looking at what are effective science teachers? I mean, what do they do? There's huge amounts of research on this and it dates back you know, a long, long time. Uh, I like the work of Walnut just because of the the breadth of his study. It's 132 heads of science of 1,210 sixth form six formers, uh, and he came up with a load of conclusions. And he was a uh, pretty well known within the field. But one of the one of the findings was a high level of subject loyalty. It was, I found quite surprising, but it was in there. Uh, specialist knowledge of the discipline, which kind of makes sense, uh, an ability to set the scientific concepts in everyday uh, context. So when you're talking about astronomy, uh, you can relate that to somebody wearing glasses, and you can talk about the lenses and so on and so forth. It's having that scientific knowledge to be able to relate it. And uh, the work of child kind of formulated this into a subject content knowledge, so you know your subject, and if you know your subject well, you're able to relate that uh, to a pedagogical content knowledge. So SCK uh, and PCK. Uh, but there's a lot of work, and it was found that student teachers who didn't have that subject content knowledge tended to ask more closed questions, the lower cognitive uh, ability, were less risky in lessons. And these were things that I could personally relate to. I, I, yeah, I'm, I saw that and I kind of had a smile to myself. Now, within the local context uh, of the GCSE, within my school, uh, there were six groups of students, or six uh, groups of students set by ability that studied the Double Science Award. Uh, it's the majority of the students within the school. We have one set doing triple, we have one set doing single. Uh, the majority uh, do the Double Science. So initially, this is how the teaching uh, is organised. So if we have two teachers, because each set is taught by two teachers, if the first one prefers biology and the second one chemistry, they would first teach their specialism under the premise that they would build good bonds with their students and get that student rapport. They would carry on teaching that in term two, just to finish it off, and then they would both join together to teach their non-preferred teaching subject. Uh, and then they did the revision and they take the exam and get the GCSE. So you start with your preferred subject, you always teach outside your subject, and then you do the revision. I was initially, without before doing the research, kind of against this. So I thought maybe if we had three specialist teachers and we just realigned the amount of hours we give, or maybe we, we rotated the class around the specialist teachers or preferred teachers. There's lots of ways to organise it. Uh, but I felt, as my role as head of physics, I'm going to recruit a lot of students from uh, these uh, GCSE science groups. And with uh, less physics teachers within the school, the probability of being taught by somebody who prefers to teach physics is lower than that of biology and chemistry, and therefore we were at a slight disadvantage. Uh, so that was kind of the premise of why I wanted to kind of research this and go into it. And also, from my own personal experience, when I'm in this term two, term three, I could have two double science sets and I'd be teaching chemistry to one, biology to another, where my own identity is actually being as a physics teacher and I find that quite a struggle to do both uh, topics, even though I've done it for many years. Uh, so the premise that I use uh, is that an effective science teacher uh, should foster positive attitudes maximise academic attainment. And these are just two questions. I also looked at the teacher's perspective, and I can talk about that if you want. But to what extent are the students' attitudes influenced by their preferred discipline? And so when I teach biology, do the students hate biology? Okay. Uh, to what extent are the students' attainment affected by the preferred discipline? When I teach biology, do they all flunk? Okay. These were kind of things that I wanted to understand a little bit more about. So it was a mixed method case study. I was kind of 
data grabbing and evidence grabbing all over the place. I just wanted to kind of form, form a picture which I could also use to influence the SNT and the head of science to make decisions. Uh, so this was the general research question. For the academic attainment, I just uh, it's a brief snapshot, but the 2013, so last year's uh, attainment within the Unit 2 modules of Biology, Chemistry, Physics. I know attainment's uh, quite a narrow uh, concept, and some people talked about achievement, although I just wanted something quite objective that I could have on a piece of paper and I could understand. Uh, whereas these attitudes, uh, I did uh, some interviews, I did some uh, questionnaires, I looked at retention rates. Uh, these attitudes I found quite difficult to de really define. So the academic attainment gave me something solid, uh, the attitudes caused a lot more debate with the SMT. Uh, so the idea of an attitude is very difficult. This is the one that I used. Uh, because you can't see an attitude, it's, it's only an inferred concept, uh, this is the relationship that we do. Uh, a student observes something, okay, so you give them a stimuli, teaching biology, they have that attitude, and they give out this attitude, or they expose that attitude, in terms of their cognitive, affective, and behavioural responses. So their thoughts, feelings, and behaviours. That's the way I kind of thought about it. So when I'm looking at their behaviour, I went on to the A-level retention rates because that gave me some concrete evidence of whether or not they're going to choose that subject post-16. Uh, for their thoughts and feelings, we were looking at questionnaires and just streaming out data from them. Uh, obviously, the attitude is also a very difficult thing to determine. Some I had to come up with ideas that students don't like giving out a positive attitude towards science because of their peers. Sometimes the attitude is different on a Tuesday than it's on a Wednesday, so it's quite a difficult thing. Now because of my position as working within the science department and working with the teachers and with the students, I had to ensure that it was all framed in a positive light. I didn't want the student, didn't want to give the students the opportunity to say, teacher X is rubbish, I hate it, blah 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 blah, because that's not going to help anybody. So it was all framed in a very positive light. So to look at the students' affective behaviours, I used terms as, this subject is the most enjoyable. So, biology, chemistry or physics. Now, we did debate whether or not there should be a no difference one, but I felt with the affective, I wanted to kind of push them into making a decision. Now that talks about reliability or not, but I wanted to do that. So I did enjoyable, interesting, relevant, easy fun. There were some other questions around here, but these were all positive language. So if you were, when I collected all these questionnaires in, if you put a tick in biology, you would get a score of one. And then if you put it in chemistry, you'd get one. So at the end, you would always have positive scores. And the most positive, the students would feel uh, the best towards. But the cognitive, because this was a little bit more difficult, I used the idea of, this teacher is the most knowledgeable about, and then this teacher is the least knowledgeable about. So it's kind of a flip, and they'd say yes or no, yes or no. And then I could have, if they were most positive about it, a score of one, and then if they were, no, if they were most knowledgeable, one, and then if they were least knowledgeable, minus one, and I'm trying to get some quantitative data there, the score that I can analyse. So the findings, things are exciting. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, for a single double science class that I'd taken over. Initially, they had a physics specialist, or it was physics preferred teaching subject, and a chemistry preferred te teaching subject. The chemist, uh, this is where my insider knowledge helps, has been teaching for a long time. <coughs> so the physicist, physicist has just started, uh, but really likes physics. Now their, their feelings, they're effective, uh, so these, this class was taught initially by uh, physics and chemistry. They felt more positive towards biology than physics and chemistry, which was counter to what I would have expected, but you know, that's what the data says. And equally, behaviourally, i.e. are you going to watch biology lessons, are you going to go and go to a museum about biology, are you going to 
go and watch a movie about biology or a documentary or whatever, they felt much more positive or they behaved more positive towards biology. So these students, they feel that if they like biology and they're going to behave positively towards biology, but in fact when I looked at how they thought about their teacher in the lessons, they felt that the teacher didn't really know much about biology, and in fact the lessons, they didn't really like them. So this kind of surprised me. I thought there would be a general correlation. So we thought, feel, and behave positive towards a subject. But in fact, it didn't seem to be the case. Now, there's a lot of literature that backs this up, that biology, okay, students really like biology. <laughs> yeah, whether it's the curriculum, uh, and some, some uh, researchers suggest that they can relate to it more and that it makes more sense and irrelevant of what's happening in the lessons, they enjoy it. Uh, I don't know, it was quite interesting. So this was uh, a little snapshot of their attitudes. And then I did uh, just chat to them and got some uh, semi-structured interviews. I looked at GCSE students within the class, but I also looked at AS students who would reflect. Now I know there's lots of issues with reflective memory, but hopefully this will have distilled and crystallized their thoughts a little bit. Uh, something that I haven't even contemplated was that because you've got two teachers teaching one subject in that third term, they get double the amount of that subject that they would normally get. So they were quite, you, the person didn't seem very positive that we had to do five lessons of biology in a week, where in fact they didn't sign up for triple science, they didn't sign up for that much of a single science discipline within a week. So they saw that as quite a negative thing. Uh, and then biology was a joke, uh, it was so much fun to teach it. I got the kind of feeling that they didn't necessarily focus purposefully on learning the material uh, for this. And this was the GCSE students. And you could kind of get a little bit of bravado out of them, but in fact they were, they were quite scared because the exams were coming up. Then when I looked at the AS students, now this uh, comes with the caveat that they were AS students taking a science. So they would initially have positive attitudes. Uh, they said they don't think the teacher went beyond the syllabus, but it was fine, because they just want to do well in the exams. Or this, this was a key thing. We learnt it like a script. Okay. So you're starting to see this kind of change in experience that the students are getting. They're learning for the exams. Now that's also potentially because of the proximity towards the exams, because it is that third term. You're very close to the exams and so maybe the teaching style is adapting towards that and that's another key factor that comes into play. Uh, but this was quite interesting. Now to get an idea of their behaviour I just looked at the A-level retention rate for last year. Uh, I looked at the national retention rate for biology, chemistry, physics and I scaled them down to biology. Uh, so I mean the key thing here is that Less students are choosing chemistry uh, than would be nationally expected, whilst more are choosing physics than nationally expected. So it's kind of thrown up lots of different ideas. And this is where, having known the chemistry department, uh, they're very keen to be very selective at post-16, and so their numbers do tend to drop, and physics is a little bit more open to different abilities. Uh, the attainment also surprised me a lot. So I looked at their attainment, their UMS scores in Biology, Chemistry, Physics, Unit 2. Uh, for the six sets, they're set by ability. Uh, so as you'd imagine, there's a negative correlation. Uh, people in set six uh, would score lower than that in six, set one. But in every single uh, set, the students scored higher in physics uh, than Biology and Chemistry. And this wasn't reflected nationally. So this kind of opened up some more questions. Why are they doing better in physics? Well, it's likely that physics is taught last because there's less physics teachers, so it's close to the exam. So maybe the students are more motivated, it's more focused. Uh, I don't have an answer to this, but this is starting to start some questions. I went in a little bit deeper and said, okay, if students are doing better in physics, uh, this is on the AQA website, how for my school, where are they gaining those marks in physics? 
And it, the AQA website breaks it down into recall, application, analysis, and evaluation. And in physics, uh, these percentage points are relative to the national average. In physics, all our students are doing much better on recall uh, than uh, biology and chemistry. So, if I was to make a bold statement, I could infer that maybe when people who don't prefer to teach physics are teaching physics, they're teaching recall knowledge rather than focusing on the application or evaluation. And maybe the students have already learned these application and evaluation skills from the biology and chemistry which they've studied earlier and those are kind of transferable. And this corroborates the idea we learnt it like a script, so we could recall it. Now, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. I think we need to get biology and chemistry up. We don't need to get physics down. We need to get them all up to this kind of level. Uh, but this kind of added some more uh, debate and discussion. So, how are they affected the students' attitudes uh, by the teacher for discipline? Well, as the literature suggests, there's an intrinsic resilient preference towards biology. Okay, so we've got an uphill battle if you're chemistry or physics, and whether that's to do with the curriculum, maybe, post 16 options, or it seems easier, or there's more biology present outside the school. There's loads of ideas there, but nevertheless, uh, this is what this case study has found. And to what extent is a student's academic ability related to the preferred discipline? There didn't seem to be a significant link, which made me feel quite good when I'm feeling biology and chemistry. In fact, you know, because sometimes you can get in the feeling that actually I'm not giving them a very good service and I'm not doing as well as I could. There doesn't seem to be a link, although the pedagogy is influenced potentially more by the proximity to the examinations rather than uh, whether or not it's a preferred discipline. So it kind of throws that into play. And you've got all of these different kind of different owners. So for further research, I mean there's loads to do, I was thinking about what can physics teachers learn uh, from the biology teachers uh, to enhance retention onto A level. That's kind of a personal one where I'm, I'm going to go speak to the biology department and so on and so forth. How can biology and chemistry teachers better embed recall knowledge? Is that to do with proximity to the examinations? Is it the pedagogy? Uh, and what we're doing at my school next year is we're moving towards more triple scientists and less double scientists. And next year we've got a fast track uh, triple science group which are going to study, study triple science uh, in much less time. And I'm quite interested to have a comparative investigation on the experiences of both uh, triple science by three teachers or triple science by two teachers. So these are just some little bits and bobs. Uh, there's lots of references. Thank you.